Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, for the record, we are not tardy. We were here. Um, we, we watched everyone come in and, and kind of the minutia of, of, of the council. We are voting across the hall and upstairs simultaneously. And, and, and now we are back uh, to address this important topic. So good afternoon. I'm Council Member Idenick Miller. I'm the chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. I'm glad to be joined by my colleague, uh, Fernando Cabrera, the chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Today we are holding an oversight hearing examining the civil service system with a particular focus on provisional employee reduction plan. In addition to the reduction plan, we will examine the length of time it takes for eligible lists to be generated as a, a civil service exam is taken. The ability of DCADs to hold civil service examinations, generate eligibility lists, and place people into jobs directly related to reducing the number of provisional employees employed by the City of New York. It is also directly related to the City's legal obligation to achieve sustain sustainable compliance with the length of provisional appointments permitted by law. The last hearing that we held on this topic was March of, of 16 with previous hearings being held in February of 15 and, and November of 14. The New York City civil service system is highly complex and marred with numerous issues specifically regarding provisional employees in general. New York City works like many other municipalities across the country, filling its positions through civil service process. To be permanently appointed to one of these positions, an applicant must take a test and pass a competitive civil service examination administered by DCAS. If there is no list of potential candidates who have passed the exam, then provisional employees are appointed, provisionally fill such vacancies. State law dictates that no provisional employee may serve for a period in excess of nine months. Unfortunately, this has not been the case in New York City or other municipalities across the state. And thousands of provisional employees have served for years in these jobs, well beyond the nine months envisioned by the state. A court case in 2007 emphasized the importance of municipalities to abide by time limitations imposed by the state and the state legislator subsequently passed a law that required all New York State municipalities, including New York City, to reduce the number of provisional employees employed. Thus, New York City issued in 2008 provisional reduction five-year plan. Since then, the city has received state extensions on its plan to substantially comply with the state law in respect to provisional employees and the um, Long Beach decision. Although provisional employee reduction plan was to have reduced all provisional employees down by at least 5% by 2013, still exists by August of 31, uh, th August 31st of 18, 17,455 provisional employees within the city's workforce. This marks a substantial reduction of, 18, of 1,898 within one quarter. Thus, DCAS has made real progress in attempting to reduce the number of provisional employees on the city's payroll and should be commended for numerous steps that it has taken to achieve such decline. But let's not just start kissing each other just yet. However, DCAS must continue to... <laughs> Pope fix. <laughs> um, DCAS must continue to work and, and, and more is needed to be done as the city is still not on target to meet its state-imposed deadline. Recognizing this and, and, and wanting to provide the city and other municipalities the opportunity to continue to implement their reduction plan while ensuring the continued quality of effect effectiveness of governmental operations, the state legislator has passed in the assembly um, bill 11241 and 8837, I'm sorry, 11241 is Senate and uh, uh, Assembly 8837. This bill, still awaiting the signature of the governor, would allow the city to update to continue to implement its provisional plan, permit DCAS to administer an examination to provisional 
employees in certain titles with specific qualifications and experience and authorize DCAS to submit the, to the state a revised reduction plan to be implemented by December 31st of 2021 to further reduce the number of provisional employees. In addition, D, if DCAS is not in substantial compliance with the new time period granted by the bill and the bill mandate, the establish of an advisor, advisory work group for provisional appointment. The city would comprise of members appointed by the government, governor, the mayor, which would prepare a recommended plan for compliance to be adopted by pursuant of state law. Legislation uh, I sponsored and that will be heard at this hearing, 1235 would require that DCAS submit to the council a copy of its new revised reduction plan to achieve substantial compliance by 2021. That is, must be submitted to the state of New York. At this hearing, I would like to hear about what is being done by DCAS in terms of keeping our true provisional reduction plan, as well as ways in which they are effectively reducing the number of provisional employees within the city's workforce. Any new and innovative approaches the city is taking to continue to reduce the number of provisional appointments should be also discussed. In addition, I want to receive an update about any new occurring any new things occurring in the city's civil service system, such as the new civil service exams, how exams are being administered, how they're being tracked, eligibility lists, length of time that they're taking to post, et cetera. I look forward to hearing um, this information and hope that we can continue to work together to ensure that the, the plan deadlines are met adequately while we are also working towards the future of the civil service system. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Joe Goldblum and Brandon Clark from my office and certainly our committee council along with uh, Ms. Kevin Kendall and the rest of the team. And uh, with that, I will give you my co-chair for the day, Council Member Fernando Cabrera. Thank you so much and good afternoon. Welcome to this joint oversight hearing of the Committee on Governmental Operations and Civil Service and Labor that will examine the civil service system and focus on the provisional employee reduction plan. I want to give a special thanks to my co-chair, Council Member Miller for his firm commitment on this issue and for your leadership. The provisional employee category exists for a reason. It allows our local government to create new programs and hire quickly to meet immediate staff needs. This ensures that essential agency functions are not disrupted. Ultimately, provisional service titles should be used to add flexibility to the city employee system and maintain agency stability. Unfortunately, for decades, the city of New York has relied too heavily on provisional appointments to serve the aforementioned purpose at the expense of transitioning to civil serv service title. As of the last quarterly report, the, still, the city still has over 17,000 provisional employees. We have met many times with DCAS Commissioner Camillo and staff to discuss the, the work DCAS is doing to provide more civil service exam, update their civil service list, and improve test taking and result posting timelines. Now I am encouraged that while DCA has not yet reached the level of provisional employees considered to be substantially compliant by the state, I have seen their concerted effort to decrease provisional employees and transition provisional employees to civil service titles through offering more testing and improving test taking and test result delivery. As an agency, you have demonstrated that you share our commitment to reduce the number of provisional employees for the sake of a robust city workforce. And I look forward to hearing through our discussion today how you will continue your good work in an equitable way, keeping in mind the various timelines set forth by the state. Thank you to the committee staff for their work on this issue, Civil Service and Labor Council, Marco. Butehorn, policy analyst, analyst Kevin 
uh, Kataski, my own committee uh, senior uh, staff, senior counsel Brad Ree, policy analyst Elizabeth Cronk, Emily Forgione, and my legislative and communications du director Claire Michael Day. And with that, we'll be showing in the next session. Hi, if you could both raise your right hand, please. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. And we just ask, um, make sure the red light is going on the microphone, and if you could just state your names and agency for the record. Thank you. My name is Dawn Pinnock, and I serve as the Executive Deputy Commissioner at the Department for Citywide Administrative Services. My name is Barbara Dannenberg, and I am the Deputy Commissioner for Human Capital for the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Miller, Chair Cabrera, and members of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor and the Committee on Governmental Operations. I am Dawn Pinnock, and I proudly serve as the Executive Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, commonly known as DCAS. And I'm joined today by Barbara Dannenberg, Deputy Commissioner for Human Capital. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss DCAS's role as it relates to provisional reduction for the City of New York. As a proud civil servant and the daughter of civil servants, I know firsthand the importance that civil service careers have on the lives of New Yorkers. Civil service, a system based on merit and fitness, serves as the foundation on which the city functions. Through the civil service system, applicants are afforded opportunities to prove their merit and fitness based on an objective assessment of their skills and abilities. It also serves as a pathway to the middle class for underserved and underrepresented communities. It is therefore critical that we operate the civil service system competently, fairly, and expeditiously. DCAS will continue to work diligently to introduce system improvements, strengthen collaborative partnerships, and reduce the provisional workforce as required, all while keeping New York City running. To that end, I would now like to highlight the successes of our provisional reduction plan, which we refer to as RP2, which highlights DCAS's commitment to address the city's provisional count. In May of 2008, after decades of neglect, the city's provisional count rose to its highest point, which was 37,797. Nearly 10 years later, in January of 2017, we launched RP2. Through RP2, we had an aggressive goal of reducing the city's provisional count from 23,296 to 17,311. I am pleased to report that as of November 22nd of 2018, the city's provisional count has, is now 17,380, which is just 69 actions away from the goal of RP2. Over the next five weeks, we will be moving forward on various fronts to close the final gap to reach our RP2 goal. This represents the first time in the city's history since it started its provisional reduction work that DCAS has come within striking distance of its provisional reduction goal and substantial compliance with civil service law by having 5% of our competitive workforce serve provisionally. Since our last meeting in 2016, we received state approval to address the city's longstanding provisional issue from January 1st, 2017 through December 31st of 2018. Over the course of the last two years, DCAS, with support of its client agencies and labor partners, has made significant progress in improving the city's com compliance with civil service law. Through RP2, we focused on four key areas, exam administration, enhanced compliance, automation, and staff augmentation. With respect to exam administration, um, I just want to first start off by providing a definition of pr a provisional employee. A provisional employee is an employee who has met the minimum qualifications for the title and may be serving sac satisfactorily in that title. Unfortunately, for some provisional employees, an examination for their respective title may simply not have been offered during their tenure. To that end, the cornerstone of any provisional reduction plan has and will always be competitive examination. Over the last three fiscal years, DCAS has administered a total of 562 exams. In fiscal year 16, we administered 105 exams, fiscal year 17, 183 exams, and in fiscal year 18, we administered a record high of 274 exams. A number of test takers has increased tremendously over these fiscal years as well. 
Another important examination-related component of RP2 was the introduction of a new testing format for the City of New York, the Qualified Incumbent Examination. On November 28, 2016, New York State passed law to amend Civil Service Law Section 65.5, which authorized DCAS to administer the QIE exams to provisional employees with at least two years of service in specific titles. As of September 30th, 2018, DCAS has administered 187 QIE exams and established eligible lists for 174 titles and has made over 4,200 appointments to transition, to transition provisionals into permanent status. With respect to enhanced compliance, um, DCAS has conducted a series of compliance meetings since April of 2017 directly with agencies to discuss various civil service issues. To date, we've held over 100 meetings with 73 agencies regarding plans to resolve provisionals serving in the face of lists, discussing opportunities to roll back individuals to their permanent titles, highlighting the importance of citywide hiring pools and upcoming hiring needs. In conjunction with our compliance meetings, provisional increases are monitored and considered for inclusion in all of our future exam schedules. This allows DCAS the flexibility in responding to the changing demands of the city's workforce while affording every provisional employee an opportunity to gain permanent status. A recent example is with our partners at the Administration for Children's Services. We were informed of their need to appoint a large number of youth development specialists. As a result, we were able to plan with them um, a hiring effort as well as add that particular exam to our exam schedule. To add to this, we also monitor provisionals through the creation of dashboards that we publish weekly, bi-weekly, excuse me, which allows agencies to monitor important provisional metrics such as citywide provisional count, provisional count by agency, and provisional count by title. Another successful tool that we have utilized has been citywide hiring pools. A citywide hiring pool allows an eligible candidate exposure to multiple agencies and multiple job opportunities at one time, and it allows us to make permanent appointments more expeditiously. Over the course of RP2, we have conducted 16 citywide hiring pools. We've also involved our labor partners in this endeavor. In addition, we have developed and deployed functionality utilizing the city's automated personnel system to centralize any provisional title changes and to stop agencies from hiring provisionally in the face of civil service lists. Last and certainly but not <coughs> least, we've also increased our civil service footprint through training. DCAS has developed and regularly provides what we call Civil Service 101 information sessions to inform provisionals of their status, but also to highlight the importance of public sector to careers to prospective city workers. Over the last two years, we've conducted 395 Civil Service 101 sessions for a total of 13,351 attendees. Automation. Autom the automation of the qualified incumbent exam process is really the only fully end-to-end -end automation exam of its type today for the city of New York. Through this new and innovative approach, we have been able to establish eligible lists for QIE titles in a record time of three months, compared to up to a year for other types of competitive exams. In our continued efforts to improve service delivery to our current and prospective employees and to reduce the cycle time associated with list establishment, DCAS is currently developing new systems working on other test formats that will be unveiled in 2019 and 2020. We are also proud to share that in January of 2019, we will be rolling out an improved online application system. This new system will provide transparency to applicants for exams and it takes a user-friendly approach to allowing our customers to self-manage their account profiles and sharing applicant dashboard information, including exam application history, test results, and notifications concerning scores for exams and, admi and admission notices. Future upgrades are also planned for 2020, which will enable DCAS to deploy the new education and experience exam via an automated format. To further our shared commitment to transparency and enhanced customer service, DCAS um, has also opened a Queens computerized testing center in June of 2017. We are grateful for the support 
that this committee and Council Member Miller in particular provided as it related to the promotion and opening of this center. In addition, we opened another SeaTac in December of 2017 in Staten Island. Finally, we will complete this footprint as it relates to testing in the Bronx when we open a testing center on 1932 Arthur Avenue this winter, which provides us additional seating for computerized testing. As it relates to soft staffing and aug staffing augmentation, in December of 2016, the Bureau of Exams received approval for 15 additional positions to increase our testing capacity. The additional staff who serve as test and measurement specialists handle all exam-related functions, which helps to expedite and augment our ability to maintain an aggressive examination schedule. As a result of having the additional staff, we were able to administer a record high of 274 exams in fiscal year 18. It has also allowed DCAS to increase our reliance on in-house exams and to limit the use of consultants to provide testing services. In conclusion, I would like to thank the council for the opportunity to testify today and for their support over these last few years. Our successes would not have been achieved without the council and particularly council member Miller's continued support and guidance. We look forward to continuing to work with you as partners and to the new state legislation, intro A11241 and S8837A that will allow DCAS to continue its work towards provisional reduction. Finally, we are looking forward to working with the committee as it relates to intro 1235, which would allow for greater transparency in requiring DCAS to post publicly its provisional reduction plans on this website and sharing it with the council. We're now more than happy to respond to your questions. Thank you so much. We've been joined by council <laughs> members Adams, Yeager, Drum, and, and Mizell has his uh, roller skates on today, so I, it, it, he went past me in the parking lot and he's now back. So, um, as usual, uh, your testimony was, was, was quite thorough in anticipating, in anticipation of what we might ask here, but we've been doing this now together for uh, about five years, so I, I really don't, um, there's a lot of questions here, and, and for some of the members who may not have been a part of the, the last hearing in 2016, that really, you know, <coughs> to a certain degree, I, I want to be able to indulge them in a little more detail about this, um, about the provisional employee, and and kind of the need based on the, uh, not just based on the, um, the Long Beach decision, but but based on its impact on the workforce and, and what that means. And so why we have such a charge to get it right and make sure that we have permanent um, uh, civil service employees as opposed to these provisional employees. And so we want to be able to drill down on that. But I, I also want to kind of do it chronologically and, and, and not drop, jump back and forth. But I do want to um, talk about at, at the current time, uh, the current timeline for the provisional reduction um, in order to achieve compliance um, with the state law, and obviously with 11241 and 8837, um, which we requires a um, revised plan. So what would you be doing differently? Obviously, you know, would you look to enhance some of the things that, that you've already done and or are you looking to do some things that are totally different from what we've seen in order to achieve um, compliance? Well, as you mentioned, um, our current provisional reduction plan is scheduled to sunset on December 1st, excuse me, December 31st <laughs> of 2018. Um, and we've actually begun um, drafting our new pre-divisional production plan um, in hopes that we will um, receive additional time. And so we intend to follow um, a hybrid approach. We certainly look to capitalize on the successes that we've had, specifically relating to the qualified incumbent exam, because as mentioned, it is the one fully automated, end-to-end -end automated system that we currently have around testing. And so to see a civil service list be able to be promulgated in a matter of three months compared to the 12 months that we um, historically have contended with is 
certainly a win for the city. Um, in anticipation of that, we've worked directly with our labor partners to have them take a look at all the titles that we believe were appropriate for this kind of testing, and we've received their feedback. Um, additionally, we've um, created our examination schedule. Um, we've also projected hiring needs that have been shared with us by the agencies to ensure that we're tapping into the right titles. But we are also continuing to push as it relates to automation. So while we um, satisfied the requirement of creating a system for the QIE exam, our next step is to focus on the education and experience exams, which is another manual exam that we have. So we've been actively working with our IT group in order to automate that as well. So. Um, so we really intend to capitalize on our successes following you know, aggressive examinations, but also um, continue along the path of making sure that we're addressing titles that the city has not historically handled for many years. What makes the, um, the QI exam, uh, aside from the automation, different from the other exams that had been traditionally administered? And has that made a real difference contributed to the difference that we've seen aside from the automation in, in reducing the number of, of provisionals? I would say the primary difference is that we first needed legal authorization to administer these exams. And the reason why we did was because the exams are only made eligible to individuals who've already served the city for at least two years in a specified title. The reason why we wanted to focus on those longstanding provisionals was first of all to come into greater compliance with civil service law. Um, but generally, someone's probation period would not extend beyond a two-year period. So we wanted to ensure that we targeted provisionals who had already served the city satisfactorily. So based on that, we needed legal authorization to not open up these particular exams to the public. Um, so we were dealing with a smaller group, and so I would say that those are more of the distinct differences and where we actually see the gains relating to going from provisional to permanent. So, so, so you're saying to, to a certain degree that those individuals were in danger if there was more of an open competitive exam, they'd exactly. be in danger of losing their jobs? Yes. We wanted to make sure that the, um, the competition pool, so to speak, was restricted to individuals who were actually performing the work. We certainly saw that as a way to strengthen um, our current workforce and also to acknowledge the fact that the only reason why these individuals had not received permanent status is because we had not had the capacity to test for their particular titles. So that is only in titles where tests were never given or had not been given during the, the time that the... Um, the uh, uh, reduction plan had been implemented? A combination. So um, titles for which there were no lists in existence, no exams in progress, or titles where they had initially been created to just have very few incumbents, which means that if you have, we always use the example of puppeteer. Mm. So we have these wonderful folks who serve as puppeteers who work for the Department of Parks. It is not likely that we're going to have hundreds of puppeteers working for the city of New York. However, <laughs> 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 However, it is a competitive exam. And so in light of that, you know, um, these folks have provided viable and valuable services to the city. It's just we had not had the capacity to test for the three to five individuals serving. So all of that contributed to um, the list of titles that we identified for the qualified incumbent exam. And you did mention that you work with some of your labor partners in, in terms of now working with them, partnering with them, and working collaboratively, which, which one was it? Did you? All of the above. They actually um, conducted a line-by-line -line review of every title that we included in the legislation. There was not a title that they had not agreed to including. And we followed the same process as it relates to the new plan that we're drafting. Great. So what, what, what is the number of provisional employees serving in excess of the um, authorized time frames? The nine month time frame? Yeah. 13,000. What is our realistic number in, in for 2021? For 2021? Well, we're certainly going to meet the goal for um, December 31st of 2018, which will bring us to 17,311. Um, 
we are actively trying to calculate what we think is a realistic number because mm -hmm. based on the last two years, we've been able to transition approximately 3,000 provisionals each year. So we follow along the same path. We are hopeful that we will achieve similar gains, which would potentially be another 6,000 6, provisionals transition over a two-year period. Hopefully, if we get more time than two years, it allows us to make greater gains. So if, if, if we continue along the path that would bring us to 6,000 over the next two, then we would need a, a, an, another, ex, another extension in order to meet our goal. Yes. Could you explain for those that is the goal zero? Is the goal 5%? Is the goal, is there a target number? So none of these questions are ever easy. So um, the goal is not zero for a few reasons. And I think that, um, that um, Chia, Cabr Chia Cabrera really frames it well because there is a need. Um, given a city of this size and scale, there is a need for provisional employment. Um, and so civil service law does provide for um, potentially a small percentage of provisionals to serve um, the city of New York. That being said, our goal is to um, reduce the number of provisional serving so we are in substantial compliance with the, with the law and to decrease the duration of time in which they are serving. Is, is, there a, is, there a, is there a timeline from the date of appointment in a provisional title to for, for a person to be, for exam to be administered, for a person to, to take an exam? Um, and or if there, is there a time frame for an exam for a title, provisional title that has been created? I know it was a lot. Yeah, so that's why I wrote it down to make sure I'm keeping pace. Okay, so um, in terms of the time frame at the time that someone is appointed, I would say it could depend. So if you are hired into a title for which there is an exam that is upcoming and part of that examination schedule, then yes, you are notified of that time frame at the time of hire. However, um, if the title um, for which you have been appointed is not on that fiscal year's exam schedule, that notification um, regarding your provisional status happens at the time of hire, but notification relating to the availability of that particular exam might happen later on in someone's career when that exam is made available. Notwithstanding, um, the HR departments across the city reach out to individuals serving provisionally routinely to inform them of other exams for which they may qualify to help them gain um, permanent status. Um, and the second part of your question in terms of provisional titles. So um, provisional is considered to be a status whereby someone is hired and they serve in a competitive title. So they are essentially just someone who is awaiting testing. Um, the titles that we have created um, have been competitive titles and as a result, we have then placed examinations on the schedule to address the provisionals who've been hired. An example would be um, the youth development specialist. There was a need at the Administration for Children's Services to provide more support within their detention facilities. Um, we created that title, but on a parallel track, we also added that particular exam to the examination schedule. So we're working with them to staff up, and thank you very much for you know getting the word out regarding that opportunity, but we specifically added to the schedule to ensure that those provisionals are not serving um, for a significant period of time. We're not, we're, we're trying to change history. We're, we're trying to make sure we get ahead of that. and civil service uh, uh, okay so so um, one may think that there are there had been exams and titles in the past that had been required that, that had been created to to circumvent uh, civil service uh, titles and status um, how have we dealt with that in, in terms of whether or not there was positions um, that were created that sort of duplicated the work that had already been were being done by permanent civil servants and created provisional titles um, that weren't competitive to do similar work, maybe at a high level and for whatever reason. How, how, how do we, and, and, and certainly 
Um, we didn't get into that in the introduction mm -hmm. on yours and, and your, um, yours and your mind in, in kind of, of the merit of the civil based civil service system. And, and, and certainly that would have an impact on that. We had seen that in the past. Um, it has also contributed to the numbers of, of uh, provisionals that we see. And, and could you speak specifically to what we are doing to ensure that that does not happen again in the future? And so um, I'll start off and then, you know, I will turn it over um, to Barbara because she is definitely a title guru. So um, specifically as it relates to our creation of titles, um, there are a few things that we've done. Um, the first is that we really took a hard line with agencies um, as it related to the justification they needed to provide as it relates to the creation of titles. So we proudly sit here today to say that over the last two years, we've created only five titles of which Three, we've administered exams, and two are on our examination schedule. So um, if you know a little bit about our history, that really is unprecedented um, for, um, for DCAS. Um, but separate and apart from that, um, we work actively with our agencies if there is a solid justification for a new title. If they are seeking not to have this title serve, um, be part of the competitive class, then they need to follow the path as it relates to our work with the State Civil Service Commission. Sure. Um, so if you wanted me to talk a little bit about um, creating titles outside of the competitive class. So DCAS has the authority to create titles in the competitive class, uh, which is uh, where provisionals would reside if we didn't administer an examination. Um, in order to create titles outside of the competitive class, um, so that would be titles that don't require um, a competitive examination, DCAS would need to hold a public hearing in conjunction with the agency that would like to use the title. Um, provide a justification for the creation of the title, but also provide a justification for um, why the title would not reside in the competitive class and why DCAS would not develop and administer a competitive examination in order to fill these roles. So uh, once we hold that public hearing, uh, we then send the proposal up to the State Civil Service Commission, who has the ultimate authority to either approve or deny our request for the creation of a new title outside the competitive class. And, and how many such requests and, and hearings or uh, hearings were granted over the past three years? So we've been um, holding public hearings about once a month over the, over the course of the plan. Uh, so I, I don't want to say it was 24, but definitely something along those lines. Um, and also most of those titles are for um, executive level positions with very few positions, one position, two positions. Um, or they uh, are positions in titles that are very specific, with very specific skills that are required to do the work. Um, for example, some very specific um, technology titles um, have been proposed uh, to reside outside of the competitive class. Okay, I would like to hear from my colleague, Councilman Cabrera. Uh, thank you so much uh, to my co-chair. Uh, just have a few <laughs> questions. You know, it would have been nice if you would have gone to 69 by today, you know, you would have, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like almost. You were right there. But that goal is for the end of the year, right? It is. So That's you're on right. track. I, I mean, you're going to finish. Yes, we're going to finish strong. That's going to be good news. Uh, so I, I, I commend you uh, because you were not given, uh, you, let, me, let me rephrase that, you, you, you were given, uh, you were put in a position that you literally inherited that was there for, for many, many years and to get it to where it's at today, uh, I know it took a lot of work. But having said that, don't you hate those butts? You know, <laughs> this is so good, but uh, no, here's my concern. My concern is that the numbers that we had was the easy picking fruit. There were the, the easiest, I'm assuming, and I know assumption is the form, lowest form of knowledge, but let me, let me start at that level, <coughs> that, that these were the fastest, uh, the, the you know, the, the exams that you gave were for the biggest groups, I'm assuming, so you could get to this point. Now, to keep that momentum, that traction, uh, what are you going to do different? Because if you keep going at the speed that you were going with the same efforts you were going, I don't see you reaching the same uh, outcome uh, because 
it's going to be harder now to bring these numbers down. Uh, is my assumption correct? Uh, it is correct, and actually, uh, these last two years were probably the most difficult two years, but um, we're very happy to say that um, over the 10 years that um, the city has focused on provisional reduction, we've reduced 14,000 um, provisional appointments, and in the last two years, we've, we've uh, reduced almost 6,000. So that's a very large um, portion of the total that we've been able to reduce just recently. So, um, so to get those numbers, you see what I mean? So yes. not to get another 6,000, another, you know, 3,000. Like, for example, who, who, where's the biggest group of, of workers right now, employees in provisional title, that, that we could give an exam and we could say, hey, we got 500 here and so forth. Or I don't even know what the number would be. Right, so there are very few um, titles like that but that exist um, anymore with hundreds and hundreds of provisionals. However, um, we can say that uh, probably uh, the titles that have um, the most hiring uh, would be those entry level, entry into the city titles. So, um, you know, certainly a new plan would focus on giving more examinations targeting those individuals. Can you give an example of those because I'm not... Sure, so um, as, as uh, Dawn said earlier, we've been partnering with the agencies over the last few years, which is something else that's been unique to this plan, um, in uh, talking about their hiring needs and when they think that they'll be hiring or if they're going to need, um, you know, if their mission is shifting. So um, an example of that, uh, that Dawn already spoke about, is the youth development specialist. So uh, we've partnered very closely with the Administration for Children's Services in creating the new title, but also in their recruitment efforts and uh, the timing of the exam in relation to their recruitment efforts so that um, employees would be brought on board, spoken to about the examination, they would understand the process and then be able to take that examination. That's a new title, permanent. right? That's a Correct. brand new title. Because I know I used to be the chair of juvenile justice, so I'm very familiar uh, with you know uh, this uh, new group of hire. But what's your like, next biggest outside of the newbies that we have right now. Uh, do you have another group that is in 200, 300? So as part of um, our current provisional reduction plan, we did factor that in. So when you mentioned about um, easy picking fruit, None of it's been easy. Mm. <laughs> but it's going to be harder. Right. That's my point. Right. And, so, and, and I'm worried. I'm really worried. And that's really been worried. part of our analysis. So um, to your point, initially, um, and, and this is certainly in our ongoing uh, relationship with the state, um, we've had to identify those heavy hitters, right? So a computer systems manager where you have a few hundred individuals serving. And so in those cases where we could offer qualified incumbent exams to address longstanding provisionals, we would then add a separate exam on our exam schedule for the new entrants. So we were trying to figure out ways to tackle some of those larger exams through, through two testing methods. Um, but now in looking at what's left, mm -hmm. you know, within um, our portfolios, that is one reason why we've asked for authorization to utilize the QIE again to tackle some of those um, exams where we have a lower number of incumbents. We've already vetted that list with labor. Um, but also we're working with agencies um, as it relates to tracking their hire so we can direct individuals to exams that are either on our schedule. And that's where the automation becomes really critical um, in terms of automating another test type just so that we can continue to churn out the exams. Who's been there the longest uh, without taking an exam? Um, Is there a particular... <laughs> Okay, I would say don't quote me, but we're going to be on the record, so someone's going to quote me. Yeah. Um, um, I would say when we reviewed our QIE numbers, we saw some lengths of service as high as maybe 15 years serving provisionally. And so while um, that's, that's a difficult thing to say, I'm also I'm proud to say that we were able to address that through a testing method, whereby someone who served the city for a significant period of time was able to take that exam and now has permanent status. So, for example, which agency was that? It wasn't a particular agency. Um, it, it would be... Well, title, um, well, title. You remember? Um, I would say trade title. Right, it could be... Probably the hardest. Right, some of the trades titles where you have fewer incumbents. I mean, I can't think of a specific title offhand, but but it would not. It was not restricted to just one. So this title. is the part that you know I, I'm not in his wonderful co uh, committee, so I don't have that 
by context. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the obvious question. What's the bottleneck? If, so if, if we have five centers, right? We're going to have five centers, not mm -hmm. testing center. And, and we walk in the Bronx. You're always the last one, so I'm going to complain. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I'm glad we're having it. I'm into solutions. Uh, but what, why does it take, I mean, why, for example, 15 years, 10, 5, why not just schedule uh, everyone, you know, just, just you know, do a one year. Can you, can you test everybody in one year? Do you have the capacity to test everyone one year? And if you can, and if you cannot, what's a, what capacity level do you have? And why not be intentional about uh, just moving forward and scheduling everybody to take a test? Right, so the city has, um, th this might be interesting for you, okay. the city has over 800 competitive titles for which we need to um, develop an examination for and administer to our So employees. that's the problem, we don't have the test. <laughs> uh, so why don't we hire more consultants to write up the test? Who, who writes this test? So the, the tests are actually developed by uh, human capital staff at DCAS. So, so why not hire more staff and let's just get this over with? I mean. Uh, what, what, what would stop us from hiring a few more staff and developing these exams? Um, over the course of the administration, we have received additional lines to help to augment um, examination services. So how much more do you need? This is the time of the year we do this. <laughs> no, <but> November? <laughs> we still in November? Yeah, yeah we still in November. <laughs> um, how many more you need? I mean, this is a this is a simple math, right? If you had this many, you could do as many tests. Because I think I found the bottleneck here, and uh, so and, and I'm sure there are others that knew that. But um, we were at this hearing. What, why don't we just hire more people and develop these tests? and just get everybody to be, uh, not everyone, because we're not gonna get ultimately there because we're always gonna have mm -hmm. new ones, but I, I, you know, I commend the agencies, we only have five new lines, you know, I'm curious to know how many were deleted, uh, but why don't we just hire more people? And then how many more people would you need to, to accomplish this goal? So for example, um, over the course of the plan, we did receive authorization to um, hire more staff to develop um, examinations and uh, for 15 people. And um, over the, the two years, those 15 people have um, assisted us in achieving, um, administering our all-time high number of examinations of 274. So they developed 274 new ones? That's correct. Okay. That's correct, so uh, not just- And how many 15. more tests do we need? <laughs> uh, I'm so glad I don't know anything about this. Because right. I get to ask the simple right. questions, so but the simple questions is the one that gave us the simple solution, A to C, you know, A to B. <laughs> right, so there are many factors that determine um, how many examinations we need or uh, which titles need to be tested for. So of the 800 titles, there not, might not be new hires um, in every single one of those titles. But of the ones that we need. Right, so no. of the titles where hiring occurs, um, again, it depends on the, the amount of hiring. So some titles have turnover, they have, um, they, they do mass hiring. You know what I, give me the ballpark. <laughs> what's, what's the, what, what is it that we need to, you know, to get to? Well, based system? on our projections, ideally, um, staying in the range of approximately 250 to 270 exams, actually could potentially cover us. However, I do need to introduce another element, so I hope that I'm not throwing our conversation off. No, go ahead. I'll come back. In, addi <laughs> in addition to addressing provisionals, we have titles where there are no provisionals serving, but we still need to create exams. So let's say for our police officers, correction officers, these are large-scale exams that we're required to develop and administer um, to ensure that we don't have any provisional serving. So the same resources that are um, utilized for provisional reduction through test administration are the same resources we use for what we call our provisional avoidance titles. So those really are our clerical titles, a lot of our um, direct service positions at our so social services agencies, and our uniform titles. So let me ask you this question, I'll close with this. I have more, but I'll, I'll come back. Uh, is there unintended costs whenever we don't test them and we keep them in, in a provisional status? Does it cost us more? Uh, and when I mean cost, I don't mean just uh, monetary. Uh, what's the overall cost here? And if it is, 
uh, doesn't it, uh, at the end of the day, if we were to hire more, regardless of whatever level, for whatever reason, whether they're there, they're not, and so forth, just to bring down these numbers, doesn't it make more sense to hire more people because it will cost us more, uh, cost us less uh, hiring them and having this test and, and having a homeostasis point of, you know, labor with, with, with you know, provisional versus uh, permanent uh, 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 positions. What's the, so what are we, are, are we talking about this? Is there a cost, a savings? Uh, so, pr um, so provisional employees, um, competitive class empo employees, other than competitive class employees, they're all paid um, according to the, the city salary guidelines. So um, provisional employees don't make either more or less than a permanent employee. They're, they, uh, they receive the same benefits and uh, they receive the same salary. Um, however, it is certainly in the city's best interest to have a stable uh, workforce working for, uh, working for the city. So. Um, what we are trying to do, uh, what we are speaking of is um, testing people as they come into city service so that people don't have to wait 10 years or, or you know, longer in order to take an examination and that they feel that they are part of the city's um, workforce, a stable part, and that they're um, eligible to you know, continue their career within the city. And job security is the same? Correct. It is. Well, oh, job security sorry. for provisional is not the same. And okay, so, I just so want that's to a big cost. <laughs> right. That's, the, that's, right. and, and that's so, the bottom line right here. That's right, safety. Right, and, and I was going to add um, okay. to, to what Barbara said. Um, just in terms of the unintended cost, I see it you know, directly tied into just kind of strengthening the workforce. So a provisional employee does not have the same job protections as a permanent employee. And so when you're talking about transitioning an, um, a provisional, potentially there's a loss of talent that impacts the services we provide to New Yorkers. So so I would say, although we've not quantified that, I view that as one of the unintended costs of not being able to address provisionals um, quickly. A worker is going to be more vested if they feel secure. And safety, and Maslow hierarchy yeah, of needs is most fundamental. Here mm -hmm. comes my counseling background. <laughs> but uh, uh, please, let's hire more people. I mean, to me, this is like a no-brainer. Hire more people, more tests, move faster. Uh, let's bring more security. Uh, our people deserve it. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I have more questions, but oh, I thanks, thank you so much, uh, Co-Chair. Um, just on the issue of uh, unintended consequences, consequences that were mentioned there, could you could you quantify what the pension implications are, if any? Mm. To well, a provisional would have rights to opt into a pension. If you're a permanent employee, you are brought into the pension system, but that is not something that I've quantified. Um, and, and, and before, I, I see Council Member Drum, he, he's got his roller skates on as well. Could you, <laughs> could you, could you just um, let us know the agencies that have the highest number of provisionals? I think you'd be interested in that. The agencies, um, these are um, some of our larger clients. So New York City Transit, um, New York City Housing Authority, Department of Transportation, Department of Parks and Recreation, um, Department of Education, um, DEP, Environmental Protection, and Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And a recent addition has been Administration for Children's Services, primarily because of our recent hiring mm -hmm. of youth development specialists. So, and uh, honestly, I, I was, was kind of uh, trying to engage my colleague Considering I tried to he spent go about quickly. 30, nearly <laughs> 30 quickly years he, at the DOE, okay. but you left it at the bottom. And, I, and, and honestly, that he was more familiar, I know from past uh, hearings, that he was able to drill down on some of the titles and concerns that we had over at the DOE, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that still, you know. Right. That, I remember he had interest with the um, occupational therapist and the exactly. physical therapist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and so forth. So, um, What is the current New York City uh, workforce headcount? We're over 390,000. Where is that compared to where we were five years ago? We actually did a 10-year look back in anticipation of your question. Mm -hmm. um, and so 10 years ago, I believe we were at 376,000, and we're now um, up to 393,000. Where so were we five years ago? Do you know? 
was on one separate experience. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. We were, just have to add the number. 300 and, 358. 358,000 in 2013. Mm-hmm. And now we're at three. We're at 393,000. So we're close to about 25,000 over the new hirees over the past five years. Approximately 40,000. For the record. Because, um, you know, I, 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 some may disagree, but I think that, as, as Councilman, my, my co-chair has said here, that, um, that we should hire, not just those who hire, but um, our public sector workforce brings real value to our city. People come here and invest here because it's safe. And we have a, a world-class police department, healthcare, education, and and regardless to what say, trans- folks say, transportation as well. And so there is an inherent value to these positions and, and you increase the value, um, the economic value as well to, to the city when, when look, we were all there when we had less employees and there was long lines everywhere, right? And that undermined the value of the city. So I, I think it would behoove us, as Councilman Cabrera said, that, that we work with agencies to identify, because look, we're still being, um, over that last five to 10 year period, uh, we were op- operating at a deficit in terms of human capital, right? We were asked, to, every agency would ask to do more with less. And that didn't work, and, and there were consequences to that. Aside from that, um, these, these public employees, these, these lives that get changed by simplest, the, the simplest entry level, and, and this has come from someone who is a lifelong, uh, 34 years as, as, as a civil servant now, um, and, and one who represents a community that has the highest number of, of civil servants in the state of New York. There is a difference to those communities, particularly communities of color. Um, We have, again, and as I often state, the highest number of of civil servants, but we also have um, the highest number of African-American home ownership in the entire country. There's a direct correlation between the two. So as my colleague said, that this absolutely has value. Why wouldn't we continue to add to that value? Why wouldn't we add to the value of New York City's, of New York City by adding to its workforce? There is a difference, certainly, in, in, in the, the, not just the status, but the value of um, a permanent employee and a, a provisional employee, not just from the standpoint uh, that the court said that you have to reduce this number uh, in fact, the court agreed that it undermined what that system was and the, and, and the intent of, of the system. Uh, so I, I certainly agree with my colleague that we, we should move forward. In doing so, um, are there specific titles that, uh, and I'm, I'm, this, is, this is oversight, so this is going to jump outside a little bit of, of uh, provisional. Are there specific titles where you see a greater need? And obviously, um, that uh, some of these, some some of the provisional exam have taken a back seat because of the need to hire uh, some of the essential services, as you talked about corrections and 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 and, and other uniform forces and healthcare and education and so forth. Is are we missing something? Is there a place, um, an agency, or a title where there is a great need? that you're seeing in your conversations with agencies? It really depends as we're talking to agencies and that's why I believe our compliance meetings are so important. Um, A standing um, agenda item in those meetings is to talk about their hiring needs. And so there were certain things that have been identified for us that were directly tied to legal mandates. So there there was a mandate um, um, that DOT had that required an increased number of engineers to serve so that they can meet a legal mandate. Through those meetings, we were informed of ACS's need regarding YDS. Through those meetings, we were alerted um, by probation 
that they actually needed us to administer probation officer exams more often because they were going through these lists so quickly. So I think that, you know, all the agencies, you know, whether they're direct service, public safety, if they're tackling a new initiative, some of our agencies handling infrastructure, they all have um, certain needs that are identified. And so we really impress upon them the importance of sharing that information with us early and often so we can best prioritize our exam schedule to meet their operational needs. How, how much of that information is being shared with this committee or the council or this committee specifically, even in terms of just uh, some of the the over 250, 40, or whatever it was exams that had been administered in that two year period, as you said, based on the QI and other things, how, how much of that information are you sharing in that, and, and I know that we've been able to partner on a number of initiatives, mm -hmm. but there are some creative ideas as well, as we just saw. H how do you engage the council so that we can further uh, partner with you in, 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 in uh, decreasing these numbers? Um, you do mean, and I just want to clarify the question, do you mean how we engage you historically or how would we like to engage you going forward? Uh, moving forward. Okay. Um, from our perspective, um, we um, share your view in that um, there's no reason why you should not see our provisional reduction plan. I mean, it is a plan that is comprehensive. It's a plan that speaks to the city's needs. And certainly, um, there's some insight that you will have, you know, given the needs of each of the councilmatic districts that can help to directly inform okay. our plan. And so really any information that we have is helpful. You know, we do share our provisional reduction plans with our labor partners because we cannot do this alone. Um, and so um, certainly having the input, you know, of your committee and just the council in general um, to flag any potential operational or hiring issues that we're unaware of, we would want to have that directly inform our strategy once we're afforded more time. And, and, and furthermore, as and, and, and I know it, it came out kind of, but uh, uh, the council member was, was absolutely sincere and as we um, began to talk about 2019, 2020's budget, you know, this is an, an important element that in the past that we were able to include uh, funding in the budget that allowed for the body, the additional bodies that were, were helpful in the creation of those ex additional exams. So that's really important to us as well as, as being your advocate and, and, and to a certain degree controlling purse strings and being able to negotiate purse strings, um, that's really important. And, and we take this plan and, and the city's workforce very seriously and the fact that we can't administer uh, examinations or, or uh, those small number of reasons that forbid us from hiring at the level that we should or when we should, um, you know, if we're working collaboratively, we, we could be able to uh, clear some of those hurdles, that I think is what we're trying to say. While we're on that, just titles in general, um, two things. How has contracting services or contracting out services impacted um, the, 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 the permanent workforce, and, and in particular, um, how has it impacted provisional, or has it had any impact on provisional employees? So in addition to um, the approval of additional lines, we were also um, provided an opportunity to have a small contract to um, outsource um, a number of exams, a very small portion of our portfolio, primarily exams that have taken us very long to um, to create and to promulgate those lists. Um, we received um, funding to assist with that. However, um, we have uh, worked really hard to keep the majority of our examination development work in house, um, and. Um, I, I don't want to assume that you know, but um, DCAS is part of um, a citywide insourcing committee where we work with our labor partners right. to identify opportunities to um, continue to insource work within the city. And so um, in order to make sure that we are walking the walk and talking the talk, we do limit um, contracting out of the work that we are able to perform in-house. So in terms of are, are you seeing an increase in, in permanent titles or even provisional titles based on the, um, the committee that, that you participate in, in terms of insourcing, 
or is there opportunity, has that opportunity manifested itself in the creation of new titles or expansion of traditional titles um, by not farming out at the same level? Um, or not farming out at all in, in, in some instances? Although I don't have the specific numbers because, um, because um, really the process is led you know, by one of our labor partners. Um, however, it has resulted in um, a decrease in um, certain consultant spending and then has resulted in um, additional individuals working within the city to perform similar work. So that really is the goal of the, the insourcing committee, looking for those opportunities um, to um, bring certain work within the city that can be done by city employees in-house. Uh, PAAs. Is, is there an, we, we, is there a current list? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think about it. Are they calling off the list, or are they still using uh, light duty officers? Oh, as the board member, sure, we can speak to that. Oh, you know, oh, right, because we were talking about um, the title represented by CWA, because there's a PAA on that side as well. So you're referring to the title that you have. Police, Police administrative aid. Yeah. Right. I know that we administrate his name, so I didn't know if the, the, the list is active. Yes, so the list is active. Um, if you're um, referring to any other hiring, we might be unaware of any hires, and, and that's not been um, one of the subjects of the so insurance conversation. So there was an agreement with the council and the police department mm -hmm. that they, uh, around civilianization, and so that there was a title. So if, if, if you are looking at the titles and the movement or lack thereof of a specific title, in this particular instance, are we are we seeing a reduction or lack thereof because those positions are being filled with permanent employees from another title so on light duty? So we can certainly take a look mm -hmm. at um, the number of appointments being made specifically off of that list. How long has the list been open? I think it's a fair. I I think it's fairly new. Fairly and so once again, we would have to okay. provide that as well. Right. Okay. Okay. So yeah, um, I'm, 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 I'm pretty much going to wrap because we can do this like forever and ever. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to allow my, my, my colleague, but I, I just want to, uh, would you be willing to uh, receive a, a follow-up questions from the com from the committee and and uh, respond you know appropriately of course and if there are specific titles um, where you are asking about movement or usage of those lists you know certainly you know we want to make sure that we're providing you with the, as much af accurate information as we can so if that's part of your questioning we're more than happy to receive absolutely that. We'll, we'll draft the committee will draft a letter and and we'll, we'll send it to you and, and expect a response so thank you Councilman Cabrera uh, thank you so much. Uh, just a quick question regarding the 2018 MMR uh, reports, a significant decrease in the time taken for DCAS to release testing results from the time of examination. So if you could explain what factors contributed to this decrease, is it reasonable to expect that the test results can be made available even faster in 2019 and beyond? And how can improvements be made to the examination so that individuals could retake the exam more quickly? Right, so um, thank you that we've uh, definitely uh, have made an effort to reduce the time that it takes for us to um, release those exam results after an exam has been administered uh, so that city agencies can hire more quickly. Um, so there are several factors that actually um, led to the decrease in that number, um, one of which, of course, was the additional staffing that we received. Um, they definitely um, assisted with um, the processes, not just in developing the exam, because we're talking about the time after we give the exam, um, and that time period consists of um, a protest review, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with. Okay, so there are several things um, that happen after an examination um, is administered that are part of the civil service process. And one of those, uh, one, of, one of the things that happens afterwards is that people who take a multiple choice test are given the opportunity to protest uh, the question. So they may feel that, um, you know, DCAS says the answer is B, but I feel like the answer C is a better answer, and here's why. I didn't get to do that in high school, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> this is a process that is unique to I'm New just York kidding. City. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Um, 
So that process can take several months because um, after the exam is administered, we give people up to 30 days to uh, submit those protests. Uh, and then we have a, a, a committee that comes in, they're called the Test Validation Board, and that's made up of labor, um, an agency permanent representative, and also a DCAS representative. And they will review all of those um, protests and make a determination. If they make the determination, they agree with the person who said, my answer is better, um, every candidate will benefit and DCAS will change the correct answers from not just B, but B and C, in okay. the example I just gave. Um, so all of that takes some time in the process. So having additional staff to help go through all of those protests, some, some exams receive thousands. Um, so that's one part of the process. Another part of the process that happens after exam administration is that when um, individuals receive their score, they have the right to appeal to DCAS. So they can say, hey, I think that my score should be higher, and here's why. Um, and so that follows another process within DCAS. Um, and ultimately, if a person, uh, if we agree with you, or there was information that wasn't provided that would have been helpful to us um, earlier on, um, and we approve your appeal, um, that individual will uh, w um, uh, be on the eligible list that results from that exam. So all those things happen um, in the months after an exam is administered. So the more people that you have working on those items, the quicker the process goes. But also, um, so in addition to uh, the personnel, uh, also the automation of exams. So um, during uh, her testimony, Dawn mentioned that um, the qualifying incumbent exam is the first of its kind, that it is automated from beginning yeah. to end. So that means that um, test takers take their examination online, they receive their score right away, they don't have to wait for DCAS, and um, if they uh, would like to appeal that score, they can do that automatically as well, mm -hmm. online. Um, so that now has cut down months and months and months of the time that it takes to establish that eligible list. So uh, again, you know, in addition to the personnel, the automation of the processes has definitely helped to decrease that time. Well, uh, well, thank you for that answer, and um, uh, you, you, you keep confirming <laughs> what I mentioned earlier. Something happens when you hire more people. You can expedite. Uh, you can move things quicker, and that goes to the test takers as well. We can hire more people. We can move uh, you know, things along uh, a lot faster. So... Uh, that's very good. My last question is in regards to the Bronx. I'm going to have to ask, I'm from the Bronx, um, for your test center. What's your capacity is going to be there? How many people are going to be able to take tests? Yeah, so the center will have um, just over 50 seats 50 for seats. test takers. Are you planning to open more centers after this? That is our intention, to open a larger center in the Bronx, yes. Okay, and when would that be? I don't have a, da a timeline or a date for that. Um, it's just an intention at this point, or is that it a real plan? No, there's uh, ac so so just to understand a bit of the history, <laughs> um, there had been another site identified oh. um, that is a larger site. Um, however, um, in work, we wanted to work on a parallel path to open up a site utilizing existing city space, and so that is the reason why we're utilizing city-owned space to open up this site, but plans and work is still ongoing in order to um, open up the larger site that, um, that we had originally agreed upon earlier. And how many would that sit? How many chairs would have? I think it was just over 100. Right. right. We 100? believe it actually doubles the capacity. Right. And how many you have in the other boroughs? Um, the other boroughs are larger. Yeah, so Brooklyn is the largest. Yes, Brooklyn is the largest. Okay, they're the largest borough. We'll give them yes. that. Okay, and <laughs> then? Are we the smallest? Second. Today. Today, yes. You know, Today. Just, uh, I'm becoming a prophet or something. But, <laughs> but, but honestly, we fast track this opening, you know, and we really need to, you know, publicly You, you know say why you fast track them? Because we <laughs> haven't had anything for years. I mean, we got to do something here. I mean, we got to, it's just unbelievable. Our people in the Bronx, 1.4 million people, always got to be tracking every other place. And we always laugh. The only thing we ever got first, you know, what was, what was it? Frozen Meals on Wheels for Seniors. That's the only thing we ever got first in the Bronx that I know of. Come on. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's get that second center uh, going ASAP because, you know, we have a lot of people in the Bronx, and I'm sure it takes this test. 
Uh, if you could send those, I don't want to take time right now to break down yes, um, how many uh, take tests from uh, respective uh, boroughs. Uh, having said all that, thank you for all you're doing. Uh, you reached a milestone that since I've been here for nine years, I have never seen anybody reach. So uh, you get a happy face uh, <laughs> today. Wow. Give my regards to the commissioner. Thank Good you job. so much. Good job. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, listen. There's very little I can say after that. I could, I, I'm sure that you guys would like to leave on that note, right? But. So I'm going to allow that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm really going to allow that to happen because this has been a, a, a five-year relationship, um, that partnership, really, that we've been able to accomplish some things in, 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 in spite of the minutia of government that we have. And, and no matter what folks have said, and, and full disclosure, uh, Deputy Commission and I in our past lives worked together on these issues. And, and so we came here knowing that it could be done. And so I'm not going to accept anything less, right? And, and so when, when we kind of get the pushback, we, we push each other. And so I'm, I'm thankful for that and, and proud to say that despite what we go through on the day to day, that there are some positive things happening, and and it is a po it is a positive when we are able to reduce this number. And I know the layperson uh, sitting on the outside thinks that a job is a job, but we, I think that we've identified the difference in the values of a permanent and a provisional employee, and and what provisional employees do to kind of undermine the whole civil service system, and how important that is to to the city that we love and that we serve and that serves so many others that we have to have committed permanent employees and, you know, so uh, we are on our way to doing so. So I thank you very much uh, for the work that DCAS is doing. While I have you, um, the online portal, could you talk about that? We can close with that. We can close with talking about the portal and the value of the portal. Um, and, I, and, and I think I remember that we were promised the tour, Mr. Chair, which is upcoming, and we could December 13th. December? December 13th, 13th is the date that we were able to schedule with your team. Okay. Could you talk about the portal and the tour? Sure. So uh, we're really excited about this portal. And again, uh, thank you. It was definitely one of the initiatives that uh, were brought up by Council Member Miller um, and the committee. Um, so the online portal, what it will do for um, potential applicants for city uh, jobs, but also you know current city employees, is that um, they now are able to go into an account that they can create themselves um, online and access any exam information um, that pertains to them specifically. So currently what people do is they'll either come down to DCAST or go to uh, one of our customer service centers in one of the boroughs um, and ask, you know, hey, what's my list number? What's, you know, what's happening? Did I pass the test? You know, so now, or they can call our interactive uh, voice um, recording message and then they can get that information that way. This way they can log on to their account and they can see their exam results. They can see when they have an upcoming exam, they can see if the list has been established for the test that they took and what their list number is and how many people are on the list. Um, and they can also, um, moving forward, they can look at you know what else is happening. I explained that there are some things that happen after you take an exam, like the protest review period and the appeal period. And so that information will also be made available in their portal. Will you be able to see uh, previous exams that were taken? That, that you're not necessarily looking at a specific exam, but you've created your own portfolio of the exams you've taken, where you are on the list, the lists are open. And, and, and most importantly, if you move, right? And I've, I've, a million times people have said, I move, by now, and I've never heard anything. What happens then? So absolutely. Uh, uh, people will be able to see their exam history going back a certain number of years. It, it, it won't go all the way back, um, you know, until 1980 or something, but um, they will be able to see exams that they have taken in the past. Um, and uh, thank you for mentioning that. A key feature will also be that people can update their um, address and where they receive official city mail um, through their portal. So they won't have to, again, um, 
go to their agency's human resources and then come to DCAS because the two systems were never combined. Um, now they can just do that for their examinations in their own portal. Um, another thing I failed to mention was um, people can now um, update their own password in their account, which in the past has, um, has been problematic for people, especially if, um, I know nobody would do that, but uh, people who apply for exams at the last minute and don't remember their <laughs> password and then they can't get into their account and they miss the filing period. Um, now they can change their password, they'll get the, you know, they'll be able to do that themselves and they don't need to rely on, you know, somebody being in the office in order to do that for them. Okay, so again, I, I want to thank you for coming out. Thank you for your testimony. Especially want to thank uh, the, the members of the committee for being here, participating. It's been a, a very busy day for all the members around here. Uh, to my co-chair, uh, I don't want to play poker or pool with you because he, he, he played like, you go ahead, you take the lead. I don't know anything about this <laughs> stuff here. <right? laughs> And then <laughs> he's singing, right? So, so thank you so very much uh, for your input, uh, council member, and certainly to uh, committee staff, uh, council, and, and your team. Thank you so very much. And to my staff, and, and, and of course, the great Joe Goldblum, who has been a sighting back there. Thank you for your work on this particular hearing. So with that, hearing's adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you.